When former Dallas County Sheriff James Clark and four other men, along with their attorneys, walked into federal Judge Robert Varner's court at noon today, each of them faced a possible five-year prison sentence and a fine of upwards to $15,000 on marijuana smuggling charges. Judge Varner told the men that their crime was too serious to suggest probation only. He handed down sentences from one to two years in prison, each to be followed by a two-year probation period. Clark received a two-year prison sentence plus two years probation. He was ordered to surrender to federal marshals in Montgomery by noon, January 3rd. Sentenced with Clark was 47-year-old Pat Campbell of Uniontown, Alabama, William Potts of Wisconsin, and Edwin Mahoy of Florida. The former Dallas County Sheriff pleaded guilty with the other men October 4th to charges of conspiracy to smuggle some 7,000 pounds of Colombian marijuana into Alabama aboard a twin-engine DC-3 in the early morning hours last May. A routine check by Department of Public Safety officials led to the discovery of the illegal pot at an airstrip at Montgomery's airport when the craft landed because of apparent mechanical trouble. The men were arrested and charged with possessing marijuana with the intent to distribute and smuggle marijuana. Eighteen hours following the arrest, law enforcement personnel burned the confiscated marijuana valued by state officials at more than a million dollars. Former Sheriff Clark left the courthouse in Montgomery today immediately after the sentencing, but did not exit the front door where he and some members of his family had entered. After sentencing, the former Dallas County Sheriff apparently did not want to talk to news reporters. So he made a fast exit out the back door of the federal building and hurriedly made his way across this parking lot where he approached a wall that leads into the Greyhound bus station. He quickly scanned this wall and then disappeared in between two big buses. Moments later, the former sheriff from Dallas County was picked up by apparently one of his friends and was rushed off in a pickup truck. Reporting from Montgomery Federal Court, George Mitchell, WSFA TV News. During this holiday season, fire department officials are urging everyone to beware of the various fire dangers presented by Christmas trees and Christmas decorations. They urge everyone to make their Christmas trees as fire resistant as possible. One way is to make sure your tree stays as moist as possible. A dry, brittle tree is a bigger threat to your safety. Keep the tree trunk in water so it stays fresher longer. If you use Christmas tree lights, use laboratory approved lights. Don't clutter other ornaments near the lights and check all wiring. Don't overload electrical outlets. Make sure all light sockets are filled with a light to prevent little fingers from poking into sockets. Never leave the Christmas tree lights on when there's no one at home. Use only fire retardant tinsel and trim, and it's a good idea to treat your tree with a fire resistant substance. Keep the Christmas tree a safe distance from open fireplaces. Above all, fire officials say, use common sense and follow the general rules of safety because you'll have a merrier Christmas if it's a safe one. Glenda Webb, WSFA TV News. One year ago this month, unit number one of the Farley Nuclear Power Plant near Dothan began commercial operations. The plant rose from the gently sloping lands along the Chattahoochee River over a period of many years, beginning in the 60s. Farley One is the first nuclear generating plant constructed by Alabama Power Company. Within a year, the company hopes to have Unit 2 also producing electricity commercially. The plant, named after Alabama Power Company President Joseph M. Farley, is very massive. The reactor containment buildings, turbine buildings, administrative offices, and other associated structures cover many acres. Farley One has, according to power company officials, been a great aid in keeping the fuel adjustment charges generally lower. They say the plant was also valuable to have around last winter and early spring when a nationwide coal strike sent many power systems to the bottom of their coal reserves. As far as nuclear plants go, company officials report no major problems with their first unit. There have been shutdowns at the plant in its first year of commercial operation, but Alabama Power Company's engineers say most of the shutdowns have either been minor adjustments or periods of evaluation for the unit. In any regard, Farley One is chugged along on a regular basis. Farley One was producing electricity for the system some time before it was declared in commercial operation. 
According to figures from the company's recent testimony before the Public Service Commission, the estimated effect on net energy cost of the plant's operations for 1977 is over $77 million. The rated capacity of the first unit at Farley, according to figures from the power company, is 807,000 kilowatts. This is more than most other single generating units in the system, and with the operations of Unit 2 of the Farley plant, it should be producing more than the total of all of the hydroelectric plants operated in the state by Alabama Power. Alabama Power Company has no other nuclear power plants under construction at the present time. There were plans for a multi-unit plant to be located in Chilton County near Clanton, but Power Company officials withdrew their request to build that plant earlier this year. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News. In this bill, farm and home property were reduced from 15% of their fair and reasonable market value to 10% of their fair and reasonable market value, which meant, of course, a third saving. For example, on a $1,000 assessment, you would have paid $150. Under the lid bill, a $1,000 assessment at 10%, you would pay $100 with a $50 savings. Now, this means $100 million or more to you people that are in this audience and that are back at home. And I can't think of any better way to serve farmers in these days of inflation and in these days of increasing cost of production than by helping them save money. This event has been scheduled to coincide with an anniversary. It is the 38th anniversary of Mayor Gunter's death. But I think a more important anniversary is that it is 50 years since Mayor Gunter decided that there should be a municipal airport in the city of Montgomery and brought this location into being. I think every one of you here assembled still remember the days of Bill Gunner. He was a benefactor, a patriot, and a great mayor. He, uh, of course, was one involved in political life within the city. And of course, anyone who ran for a public office in this state always wanted to talk to Mayor Bill Gunner. He had an impact on the politics in this state and in uh, the course of history of this state due to his dynamic and forceful personality, his foresight, and his dedication and love of people. As mayor of the city of Montgomery, I think Mayor Gunner's legacy to the city was his family. The six daughters and son, and now then their uh, children, and what this great family means to the city of Montgomery. Max Kane of the Alabama Department of Public Health says the Cancer Detection Clinic will provide free services for medically disadvantaged women over age 35. Presently, Alabama's death rate from cervical and uterine cancer is among the highest in the nation. Each year, these two types of cancer alone claim the lives of two of every 200 women in the state. One of the reasons Alabama's death rate among women is so high is the lack of proper medical attention. In 1977, only 20% of Alabama women had a pap smear. Kane says the tests are virtually painless, but are essential to the detection of cancer. It is a painless test. Uh, to do a pap test is no more than taking a little uh, wooden scraper and just rubbing the inside of uh, the cervix, which is the mouth of the womb. Uh, the, the, pain, the, the pain involved in taking a pap test is uh, of course, I can't say with authority because I'm not a female, but uh, I'm told by females that this is an absolutely painless test. Oh, say how long would the whole procedure take? Taking a pap test from the time uh, she goes into the clinic room until she comes out, uh, she may have been in there 15 minutes, but uh, the test itself takes only about a minute. The clinic is open every Monday from 1 to 4 p.m. at the Montgomery County Health Department on West Jeff Davis. Janet May, WSFA TV News.
That's enough. That's enough. That's enough. Well, I think the first thing that uh, they should they could consider is to be a faithful worker and uh, true to their bosses. We knew uh, shortly after the hearing on November the 8th that we'd be receiving an order from the PSC on November the 22nd for all bills due on and after that November the 22nd date. Uh, for this reason, we did not issue bills for about two days before the 22nd, knowing that we were going to have uh, a change in our rates, uh, that the only rates which would be legal and proper for us to bill on for any bill due after the 22nd would be dependent upon the Commission's order on the 22nd. We really didn't know what that order would be, whether it would be an increase or a decrease or what, but we knew that it would be effective November the 22nd, and therefore we did not issue bills on November the 20th or the 21st in expectation of the, of the Commission's order, which would concern bills uh, due on the 22nd. So we are going to petition the court and ask the federal court to approve our plan our plan is basically constitutional. It is constitutional. It has been approved by the Justice Department, and our plan follow the legislative line that was drawn by Mr. Dees himself, basically, in the redistricting of the Alabama legislature, which was approved by Judge Johnson. And I was only trying to do what Judge Johnson had ordered the legislature of Alabama to do. In the next budget presented by the Department of Defense, the money will be in there for the consolidation of Navy, train, Navy helicopter training here at Fort Rucker. Two squadrons at least will be kept at Corpus Christi and it will continue to be a viable base. And all helicopter training for the Navy will be transferred to Fort Rucker starting next year. Bottom line is that if all goes as has been outlined and agreed, before the next Christmas comes around, we'll see some blue uniforms and white hats here in Fort Rucker and in the Wiregrass area. So I'm very pleased to have the opportunity of making this announcement. It's sort of a dream come true for many of us, and it couldn't come at a better time unless it was just before the election. <laughs> General Croson's analysis of today's armed forces indicated that our men in uniform still deserve our trust and confidence, but the capabilities of those men depend a great deal on the equipment they have to work with. Croson said when people speak of the quality of today's army, no one talks about the obsolescence of the equipment, a case in point, the recent Guyana operation. We went again with a no warning kind of call. The soldiers and the equipment that we had on hand in those units were the ones who had to respond to the, to the call. We would like very much to have sent those troops with the new Black Hawk helicopter, but in fact they were equipped with a Huey in those helicopter units and they went with the Huey. The Guyana operation was a small illustration of why we talk about a come as you are war. This conference that we're having now here at Fort Rucker is all about new equipment, new aviation systems, the things that we would like to buy for the Army off in the future. But it's important for everybody here to remember that if war comes tomorrow morning, our soldiers are going to go with the Huey and the Cobra and not with the UTAS and the new advanced attack helicopter.
General Croson reflected on the recent Guyana affair, saying those actions show that the world we live in is not sane and rational. Therefore, the strength and readiness that's expected of the United States Armed Forces must be preserved. From Fort Rucker, Alabama, Janet May, WSFA TV News. Coach Livings and Mr. Head, it is with great pride that I, on behalf of the Alabama High School Athletic Association, present this 1978 Class 4A State Championship football trophy to Jefferson Davis High School. Congratulations to all of you. We consider this a trophy which says that we, the entire school at Jeff Davis High School, that all of us, every one of us, all people involved in every capacity of this school are 4A state champions. This is a season when precious stones are a favorite gift item for those who can afford to buy them and greatly appreciate it by those who receive them. This year, hundreds of millions of dollars in diamonds are expected to be purchased by consumers, but diamond experts are warning that cheap stones are being altered by x-rays and are being made to look more expensive than they really are and being sold for high prices. John Rainey, Montgomery gemologist and jewelry store manager, says be careful when buying a stone. I think the major precaution you can take is know the people you're dealing with, that uh, it's represented to you properly, you know the background, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Okay, why is iridation so popular now in the gem world? They can take a lower grade color stone and make it almost any color that they want in the rainbow. You can get red and pink and blue and green and yellow and brown, all different color diamonds. Is that as expensive or valuable as a naturally no, uh, sir. lighted stone? No, sir, it isn't. What is the difference in terms of value? I would say it would probably be, well, it depends again on the carat weight and the clarity color, uh, clarity grade of the, of the stone. Oh, like take one carat, for instance, the difference in price and value oh. of an irradiated stone and a normally perfect diamond. Okay. Not too long ago, I saw a pink, a natural pink emerald cut stone. It sold for about $50,000. Now, if it were an dated stone, I doubt if it would be two. $2,000. Right. Perhaps the best advice we can give you is not to let your Christmas spirit override your better judgment in purchasing a diamond or any other gem. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA TV News, reporting. Two streaks came to an end last night when AUM beat Tuskegee 68 to 66 in the opening round of the Montgomery Tip-Off Club Tournament. Prior to the game, Tuskegee had won four in a row while AUM had lost five in a row. This action was from the first half, which the Senators dominated. AUM led by as many as 11 points in the first half and were on top 36 to 31 at the intermission. The Golden Tigers battled back after the half and went ahead several times, but the Senators hit some crucial free throws at the end of the game to seal the win. Derek Goggins led the scoring for AUM with 14 points, while Carl Bailey paced Tuskegee with 21 points. AUM will play Jacksonville State tonight at 8.30 in the finals of the tournament, while Tuskegee will face Huntington in the consolation round that gets underway at 6.30. James Spann, WSFA-TV Sports. Alabama Power Company contends that the Montgomery County Circuit Court did not have jurisdiction in this case because of the controversy over the rate increase. The Alabama legislature passed a law during the last regular session which states that all cases affecting rates or charges should be appealed directly to the Supreme Court. However, attorneys for the state and other interveners claim that this is not a rate case because the Public Service Commission had no authority to issue a rate increase from a complaint case. This proceeding stemmed from a complaint brought against the utility by Governor George Wallace in 1977. The governor's attorney, Maurice Bishop, today told the court that he is also representing newly elected U.S. Senator Donald Stewart. 
Although the Supreme Court and attorneys for the state and the people of Alabama consented to allowing cameras and other electronic media in the courtroom, Alabama Power Company denied our request. Reasons for the denial were not given. During the proceeding, the question of whether a law exists which allows a rate increase to be granted from a complaint case. The utilities lawyers cited previous cases of this incident. The state says there is no such law. It also contends that the Supreme Court should not set aside the order because the power company did not apply for a stay in the circuit court and they did not ask for a bond as required by law. Alabama Power Company says it's losing $600,000 a day and will continue to lose three to four million dollars from industrial customers over the next few days. The ruling in this case will not only determine whether the Montgomery County Circuit Court had jurisdiction, but it will also set a precedent for future cases affecting rates and charges. From the Alabama Supreme Court, Janet May, WSFA TV News. Uh, we're merely restating this policy of saying that our first uh, call shall be uh, and first priority shall be to those citizens in the city limits. We will respond in the police jurisdiction with available equipment if we, if we can, and we do that. We, uh, in this past year, have responded uh, in the, in, uh, inside the police jurisdiction uh, to some 350 calls in the police jurisdiction. Uh, outside the police jurisdiction, we have absolutely no jurisdiction. And so we will only respond to a call outside the police jurisdiction if it's a matter of life and death, or if we've been called for assistance by a state trooper or by the sheriff. Did you come directly to the United States from Russia? I don't know what you want to do. What? 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 Keep, keep doing what you want to do.